Here's a fun one. What's the size of Portugal and might just end up destroying the world? It's not an asteroid headed this way. At least I hope it's not. No, it's the quantity of energy required annually to power the world's most popular cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. In fact, it now takes more energy to mine $1 of Bitcoin than $1 of gold, copper or platinum buried deep in the earth. So what if the song lied to us and money doesn't make the world go round? What if money actually makes the world and our survival on it unsustainable in the extreme? Firstly, let's define what cryptocurrencies actually are. How do they work? What do they smell like? And can I use them to buy one of those delightful glitter pooing unicorns that are so popular right now? The word cryptocurrency can be easily divided into two parts. Crypto comes from the Greek word crypto, which means concealed or secret. And currency comes from the English word currency, which means money or currency. Currency has a long and storied history. First there was barter, then coins, then paper, then plastic, and now people desperately wiggling their phones over contactless payment readers in busy pubs. But whether metal, paper, plastic or digital, these kinds of currency are controlled by banks, regulated by governments, otherwise known as the man. These institutions controlled how much the currency was worth, usually took a cut of any money they dealt with and also had to be trusted to look after our cash and data securely, which recent banking crashes and scandals have shown to be quite tricky. It's at this point in 2009 that a figure called Satoshi Nakamoto pops up, or rather doesn't pop up as this is probably a made up name and might well not be an individual at all. Regardless, this is the name at the top of the white paper that defined and created the first legitimate cryptocurrency to be traded, Bitcoin. What Mr. or Mrs. or Messrs. or Reverend Nakamoto proposed was that rather than financial institutions keeping control of our spondulix, we should be able to exchange money with each other directly, in exactly the same way that naughty people on the internet used to share the latest episode of South Park before it was on the telly. A peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system with no one in charge and no one taking a cut. So Bitcoin had a technical template, but it needed two things to flourish. Two things that old money gained from banks. Confidence and security. I mean, you can't just make up a brand new money system and then start chucking it all over the place like a rapper in a car showroom. Otherwise, we'd all do it all the time. That's where the crypto element of cryptocurrency enters the picture. Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies use a complicated system of codes and ciphers to ensure that the currency itself and the transactions they are involved with are secure. Firstly, when you join a particular cryptocurrency network, you are issued with a key, which is a coded chunk of data that individually identifies you so no one else can steal your identity. Then, when you're about to make a transaction, you inform the rest of your cryptocurrency network by using your key. So I got into blockchain in 2010, I'd say. If you ever find yourself in a party cornered by someone who's heavily involved in cryptocurrencies, you can expect to hear a lot about blockchain. Yeah, as I was saying. While regular human citizens take their money and deposit it in a bank, and that bank is made up of cashiers and paper and pens and those squiggly little toys for kids, cryptocurrencies don't bother with any of that. They have no centralized authority. Instead, they use this blockchain. Let me try and describe blockchain. Imagine you have a large, fabulous art collection, and amongst your acquisitions is this, a genuine original pranksy that you prized off the side of a local community center and is worth several million quid. You've had interest in purchasing this artwork from noted art collector Sir Elton of John. But what's stopping you, a deeply flawed individual, from promising this same piece of artwork to some other art collectors at the same time, like Kim Kardashian? Or Bradley Walsh? Or for that matter, knocking up a load of fake pranksies and flogging those off as well. How can somebody be sure that they're about to buy a real work of art? The obvious answer would be to call in a group of the world's leading pranksy experts to scrutinize the work. They make sure it's a legit artwork and that there's only one sale going on. You get several million quid and Elton gets a mural. Better luck next time, Kim Kardashian and Bradley Walsh. And the blockchain governing a cryptocurrency works in a broadly similar way. Each blockchain is a virtual and crucially public record of every transaction made with that particular cryptocurrency. So when you go to make a transaction known as a block, other users are able to verify the details before you complete the sale, adding a block to the chain. Block chain. Individuals who oversee these transactions are called miners. These are the art experts, checking the authenticity of your pranksy. Except there are millions of them checking millions of artworks or transactions every day. And if a miner were to lie, 
for example, claiming a worthless scribble by moi was actually a priceless praxy, the other miners would spot the fraud and correct it. In return for volunteering their services, miners are rewarded with a portion of the cryptocurrency involved. So what is stopping me, you or Elton overseeing the same transactions and getting paid for it? Well, this is where things get even more deliciously complicated and is the bit that could potentially murder the world. Mining is a first come, first served process or more accurately, first come, first solved, as each transaction is accompanied by a very complex mathematical equation. The first miner, or rather, miner's supercomputer farm, who solves this equation gets to validate the transaction and takes the reward. This is called proof of work. On average, it usually takes a miner's farm about 10 minutes to solve this equation and verify a Bitcoin transaction. Yes, I did say supercomputer farm. Before you cross out your current occupation in your passport and scroll cryptocurrency miner over the top in biro, do bear in mind that the amount of hardware, cooling systems and electricity required to deal with those sorts of equations means it's really, really hard to actually make any money as a miner. To compound this, as more people start trying to verify transactions, the block creation rate increases, lowering the value of a block. To compensate, the algorithm makes the proof of work equations harder to solve. The result is an old fashioned tech arms race. And it stands to reason that very clever, globally distributed, equation-solving, transaction-verifying supercomputers use an enormous amount of energy. Estimates suggest that a single Bitcoin transaction uses more energy than a quarter of a million Visa card transactions. This is roughly the same amount of power as the average American home needs for nearly two weeks, and you just know they've left the lights on all day. And that's just one transaction. As of right now, almost lunchtime on Friday the 22nd of February 2019, there are on average about 300,000 Bitcoin transactions per day, leading economists and ecologists to equate Bitcoin's energy consumption with that of a medium-sized first world country like Singapore or Portugal. Sadly, the problem is getting worse. As more transactions occur, as more cryptocurrencies are introduced, and as mining equations grow more complex, even more energy is needed. China has emerged as a big Bitcoin miner, with coal-burning power fueling most of their work. Our wonderful new financial utopia is prodding Mother Nature heartily with a big soot-covered stick, and damage to the Earth's fragile climate could be considerable. So, are there any ways to make cryptocurrencies greener? Well, some new currencies are using a method known as proof-of-stake. In proof-of-stake currencies, miners become validators. A validator has to stake an amount of their own money against approving the transaction, with those placing larger stakes being more likely to be chosen to validate. Now, rather than everyone maxing out their CPUs in a race to solve an equation, one person is chosen to solve it honestly, with their stake as surety. If you were to validate a fraudulent transaction, you lose your stake and your reputation. Meanwhile, countries like Iceland and Austria are harnessing their extensive geothermal and hydroelectric resources in the name of crypto. And some companies are focusing on renewable energy to power their cryptocurrencies. So, is there a danger of these cryptocurrencies taking the place of good old clunky pounds and pence and polluting the planet as a consequence? Well, it seems unlikely right now. There's still a limited amount of things you can actually get with crypto. And most people get a hold of their bitcoins by using traditional currency in the first place, which sort of makes the whole thing pointless. But who knows? A decade ago, the thought of using your phone to pay for a cup of tea seemed to be the arena of pure fantasy. And now we do it all the time without thinking or caring. Which means that unless our boffin overlords don't devise safer, greener ways of powering cryptocurrency tech, Earth's climate might be facing even more of a kicking. A kicking it could probably do without at the moment. Just one more thing for you to worry about and lose sleep over. Just don't leave the lights on. Good night. <laughs>